Welcome, my name's Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. So I'd like to welcome you all here today, and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called, Only the Humble Will See God. Only the Humble Will See God. And firstly, let me just say that God loves you, and the Almighty God, He created all things, and he created you. And God has a wonderful plan for everyone and everything in this world. And God's plan is, plan is found in his book called the Bible. And the Bible contains God's words written down so you can know and understand uh, God's love and to worship him, your creator. God is love. And God is also pure, holy, Peaceable, joyful, good to all, kind, slow to anger, forgiving, merciful, just, honest, and he cannot lie. He is, the, he is wonderful. He's the counselor. He's the prince of peace. He's the almighty God. And he is also light. And in him is no darkness at all. And love needs expression. And so the Godhead, who is the Father, the Word and the Holy Spirit, created this world and all things, including mankind. And the Bible reveals God's love and special plan and gift for you. So this topic is called Only the Humble Will See God. And God, as I said, has a wonderful plan for each person's life. However, for it to come to pass... A person needs to be humble. And to be humble means to have and to show, have a low estimation in one's own importance. It's about being modest in their pretensions and a low rank, right? You're not above everybody. You're, you know, just keep things balanced here. And the opposite to being humble is being proud. And Pride is having an exaggerated opinion of one's own importance and having an unduly high opinion of one's own qualities and merits. And you know what? God hates pride. Now, we just said God is love, but God hates pride. And I'm just going to open my King James Bible to Proverbs chapter 3, just after Psalms. Proverbs chapter 3. Actually, I'll change that. We'll go to Proverbs 8 and verse 13. And it says here, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the fraud mouth do I hate. The Amplified says, The reverent fear and worship or awe of the Lord includes the hatred of evil, pride, arrogance, the evil way, and perverted and twisted speech. I hate twisted speech is like lying. He hates it. And when we love God, we too will hate pride. And chapter 9, verse 23. Nine. Maybe it's 19. I'll just check that. Sorry, it's Proverbs 20. Proverbs 19, 23, it says, The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that has it shall abide satisfied, and he shall not be visited with evil. The fear of the Lord. We need to have a reverential fear of the Lord. And then when we do, we'll be not visit, be visited with evil. And Proverbs 13, it says here in verse 10, only by pride comes contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. All right, contention, that means strife, dispute, rivalry, competing, quarreling and arguing. That comes about because of pride. And scripture shows us that God blesses unity. However, God will not bless disunity. He will not bless strife. 
and a proud person, they want their own way and think that their way is the only way, usually without acknowledging anyone else's ideas. It's all about their idea. And also a proud person often wants the last say. You know, sometimes in families, there can be just strife and upsets. And sure enough, there's someone who's got to have that last word, right? But the scripture says, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. Don't put logs on the fire. Don't just keep adding fuel to the fire. Leave off, right? Because God can't bless it. And it comes out of pride. Proverbs verse 16, verse 5. It says here, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. And that word abomination, it means disgusting. God thinks anybody proud in heart is disgusting. That's pretty strong, isn't it? And the Amplified says, verse 5, Everyone proud and arrogant in heart is disgusting, hateful and exceedingly offensive to the Lord. Be assured, I pledge it, they will not go unpunished. And verses down 18 and 19, it says here, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to have, we'll just look at the Amplified on that verse 18, Amplified, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And verse 19, it says, Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. And the Amplified 19 says, Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the meek and poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Why? Because the proud are going to be cut off and punished. You don't want to be with the proud. And again, God hates pride and the result of pride is destruction. Because we just read before pride, pride goes before destruction. So the result of pride is destruction. And so if we lift ourselves up, or think ourselves better or more superior than others. According to this scripture, we're headed for destruction. God puts it, makes it really plain. And Proverbs 29 and verse 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Right. And let's turn over to Psalm 10. You know, God's given us his word. So turn back to Psalm 10. God's given us his word because he loves us. He wants to teach us and train us in his ways so we don't, so we're not destroyed and suffer destruction. Psalm 10 verse 4. And we read here, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. The Amplified says, The wicked one in the pride of his countenance will not seek, inquire for, or yearn, yearn for God. All his thoughts are that there is no God, so he'll never punish. A proud person trusts in themselves rather than in God. A proud person thinks they know better than God. Well, how foolish is that? Because God is all-knowing. No one knows more than God. And God is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, the author and the finisher of our faith. He knows it all. And you can't hide anything from him. <laughs> so, and you don't know better than him, right? He knows everything. And if we turn over to Mark chapter 7, we're going to read what Jesus said. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Mark chapter 7. And Jesus said in verse 21, let's read there. Verse 21. For from when out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, that's sexual intimacy with someone you're not married to, fornications, that's someone who you're definitely not married to, having sexual intercourse, uh, murders, and it, scripture says to hate is to murder. These come from the heart. Thefts, so to stealing. Covetousness, that's wanting something, things that other people have. Wickedness, well, that's pretty evil stuff. Deceit, that's deception. Lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, taking the Lord's name in vain. 
pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile the man. And no person defiled is going to heaven. Let's read it from the Amplified, verse 21. For from within, within, that is, out of the hearts of men come base and wicked thoughts, sexual immorality, stealing, murder, adultery. God's standards are not man's standards. God's standards are much higher and they're higher because they're better. Verse 22, coveting a greedy desire to have more wealth, dangerous and destructive wickedness, deceit, unrestrained, indecent conduct an evil eye, envy, slander, evil speaking, malicious representation, abusiveness, pride, the sin of an uplifted heart against God and man, foolishness, folly, lack of sense, recklessness and thoughtlessness. So we've just read there that pride is sin. And pride is in the heart of every person because we're all made of the same stuff. And therefore, everyone, everyone needs to watch out for pride as well as all those other activities. But we're just focusing today on humility, but pride and, um, and we need to be aware of it. And let's turn over to 1 John chapter 2, right down the back before Revelation, 1 John chapter 2. And this is the way the Bible says it. 2 verse 16 and we read here for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world in the amplified verse 16 for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh craving for sensual gratification and the lust of the eyes greedy longings of the mind and the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. That's all there. It's in our heart. And yet God knows what each one of us is like. And he is a loving Heavenly Father and he is so merciful. We should have been snuffed out a long time ago because of what our hearts are like. But he is so merciful. He just wants to draw us to himself. And, you know, in the natural, a, nat a mother doesn't scold or give up on their two-year-old child and banish them from the kitchen because they spilt their milk. No, a loving mother cleans up the messes and, and starts to train the child more so that they don't spill the milk, so they don't, you know, toss the towel and so forth. You train children and it's the same with God. God loves each one of us and he's merciful and he continues to clean up our messes. And our part is to learn to walk with him, learn his ways and grow spiritually. God does not want you to stay a spiritual baby and keep knocking your milk over and throwing the tantrums. He wants you to grow up spiritually. And if we turn to Isaiah 55, just after Psalms and Proverbs, Isaiah 55. And we read here in verses 1 and 2. And it says here, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that has no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which satisfies not. Hearken diligently unto me, this is the Lord saying, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. You know, people just go looking for all sorts of things to satisfy their heart, to satisfy the emptiness within. They, go, they get into all sorts of things, careers, money, relationships, material things, everything to try and fill that something's missing in their life. It's not another person. It's not a brand flashy car. It's not a giant mansion. Those things in their right place, there's no problem. But what happens is people go after those things and they miss out on what God has planned for them. And those things, as enjoyable they may be, they will never satisfy the heart of man. They were not meant to. Only God can fill that emptiness within with his love. 
And also God doesn't want you struggling through this life. He did say that as we put him first and put his kingdom first, other things that we need in our life will be added to us. But the condition is that we put God first and then he adds the other things. And so meanwhile, being humble is the opposite to being proud. And the Oxford Dictionary says that to be humble means to having or showing a low estimate of one's importance, of a low rank or condition and a modest pretension. You're not trying to be something you're not. You're not big noting yourself, not, not patting yourself and, and you know, put, look, looking down on everybody. That's pride. But humility is, you know, we're all on the same. We're the same. Every person on this planet, God created. So no one's above and no one's below. In God's sight, he loves us all the same. And we are to love God and love one another. We are to love God and love everyone. Not, oh, I don't love you. Oh, but I love you. Oh, but I don't love you. Oh, I couldn't possibly love you. No, we are to love God and love one another because we are all made in his image. And God knew exactly what he was doing when he made each one of us and he's given us all different giftings. So we can't say, oh, that person, I don't like that about that person. And you're pointing the finger. Have you noticed that? When you, when you start speaking against someone, you are pointing the finger. But the amazing thing is, there's three fingers pointing back at you. And often the faults you sometimes see in others can be the very things that are in you, being mirrored to you. So, you know, we can't point, we shouldn't point the finger. And, and surely there's shortcomings in every person because no one's perfect. God is perfect. But, you know, we can pray for others. And if we think there's um, shortcomings that God, you know, we would like to see God fix in that person's life, pray for them. Pray, go to God and pray for them. Uphold them. Don't just slander and mouth off about them. Go to God. Be merciful. Learn it God's ways. Be, be gracious. Be kind. Don't just slam them back. Just because they did that to you, you don't do it back to them. That is not God's way. Because it, the, I'll tell you what is God's way. You will reap what you sow. Whatever you put out, it's coming back. It's a principle of God. So if you slam other people and speak badly about other bad people, it's going to come back to you. But when it comes back, it comes down, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It comes back more than what you give out. So our lives um, are never dull in God and he allows us to be in situations and those situations are revow, reveal what's in our heart. Are we going to trust God? Are we going to believe for that person and uphold that person? Or are we just going to try and be king ourselves and everybody's under us? No, everybody's under God and we are all under God. All right, so we've just got to have things in their right perspective. He's number one. He's God. That's it. That's it. And we just, um, if we go to Matthew 23, Matthew 23, and verse 12, it says here, and this is what Jesus said, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall be humble himself shall be exalted. To be abased it means to be lowered. It actually means to be humiliated. And here Jesus is saying, they who exalt themselves are going to be abased. They're going to be put down. Won't, and God, God knows how to put everybody in their place. It's better to let God put you in your place. Otherwise, you will come against people in your life who God will use to put you in your place. Because he loves you so much, he wants to bring those adjustments in your life. And the Amplified says here for verse, verse 12, it says, Whoever exalts himself with haughtiness and empty pride shall be humbled, brought low. And whoever humbles himself, whoever has a modest opinion of himself and behaves accordingly, shall be raised to honour. What a great promise. So everybody that humbles themselves, God's going to exalt. God's going to promote. All right. And if we turn over to James chapter 4, down the back, James chapter 4 after Hebrews. James chapter 4 and verse 10. It says here, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. 
the Amplified says, humble yourselves, feeling very insignificant in your present in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. He will lift you up and make your lives significant. Isn't that special? God wants to make your life count. You don't, we, don't, we don't want to just go through this life day in, day out. We want our lives to count. Everybody only has one life and you want it to count. And God wants to make your life significant. And the true meaning of life, it comes from the Lord fulfilling his plan in our lives. And our part is to commit our lives to him, into his hands and allow him to lead and guide every area of our life. And it's all going to be about his glory. And I'm just going to turn back to Psalm 10. Psalm 10. And it says here in verse 17. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart and thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. The Amplified says, O Lord, you've heard the desire and the longing of the humble and oppressed. You will prepare and strengthen and direct their hearts. You will cause your ear to hear. You know, the Lord hears the prayers of a humble. A humble person is going to call out to God. A proud person will go, I'm not even going to talk to God. But a humble person will run to God. A proud person will run away from God, draw back from God. But a humble person draws close to God. And Psalm 34. And we read here, verse 1. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. When? All times. <laughs> We're to bless the Lord at all times, not just on the good days or the sunny days. We're to bless the Lord all the time. We're grateful and love him every day. Verse 2, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. To magnify the Lord is to see him bigger than our situation. And so to do that, we've got to take our eyes off our situation and get them back on the Lord. If we just look at our situation all the time, we will just get in a muddle. But if we lift our eyes up to the Lord, magnify him, see him bigger, he's able to sort things out. And it says there that he can deliver us from all fear. A lot of people suffer from a lot of fear. But, you know, if we put our trust in God, he will sort that fear in our life out. Just allow him, let him sort things out. He wants to help each life go better. Hallelujah. All right, let's turn over to... Uh, Second Chronicles, so that's going back. Second Chronicles, a few books. Second Chronicles, two Chronicles, chapter 7. And we read here, verse 14, chapter 7, verse 14. It's in the Old, in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles. And verse, chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God desires us to humble ourselves, to turn from our own ways and to turn and follow his ways. And when we do, there's forgiveness and healing. Got it? We have to humble ourselves. We turn to God, turn away from our own ways, turn towards God, follow his ways, and then there's forgiveness and healing. And so many people uh, need, well, everybody needs forgiveness, of course, but so many people get into a muddle, even healing. You know, their, their bodies are all messed up, but often it's because they're nowhere near God. God wants to administer healing, but we have to humble ourselves and go to God. And if we turn over to Isaiah, so after Proverbs, Isaiah 55. And just starting here in verse 6. And it says here, Seek you the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
For my, this is the Lord saying, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's thoughts and God's ways are so much better and higher than our little thoughts, right? They're so much better. So why not connect with something higher and better than ourself? Because he's got all the answers. And God is so merciful and compassionate towards everyone. And he even continues to draw us to himself. I'll just read it. It's Lamentations. I've got it marked here, so no need to turn to it. It's Lamentations 3, 22 to 25. It says, it's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not because they're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him to the soul that seeks him. You know, so many people are without hope and in despair, a depression, right? Because God is not number one. And so they're without hope. They're just going, they're just going the way of so many. But God wants us to get anchored, anchor our lives in him. And he wants us to, us to seek him and just go after him. And we'll find him when we search for him. You know, have you ever gone looking for something? Something's gone missing? Where is it in the sock drawer? Where is it? You know, where is it? Where is it? But when you find it, it's great. Well, God wants everyone to find him because it's great and he's merciful. And some days, 24 hours is long enough. You know, some days can be a very long day. But the sun comes up the next day and his mercies are new every morning. And so he's just there to help us every single day because he loves us. Hallelujah. And so today is the day to seek the Lord and to receive his love and mercy. So right now, what separates us from God? Well, firstly, we need to understand that God is holy, righteous and pure. And so what separates us from God? Sin. God calls it sin. And sin is disobedience to God and his word. And so where did sin come from? Adam, who was the first man created by God, he disobeyed God's instructions. So let's turn to Romans chapter 5. After John, Acts, Romans chapter 5. And verse 12. And we read here. Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The Amplified says, Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, and death as the result of sin, so death spread to all men, no one being able to stop it or to escape its power, because all men sinned. Sin, if we understand it, passes through the bloodstream of males. And so that is why this scripture is very clear. All have sinned. So all has sinned includes you and me. All have sinned. And if we turn to verse 19, it says, For by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, being Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. It's our sin that brings death and separation from God and stops us from going to heaven. It's our sin. We've got to take ownership of it. And chapter 3, verse 10, it says here, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And the Amplified says, as is written, none is righteous, just and truthful and upright and conscientious. No, not one. Right? That's the same as all have sinned. There's not one person perfect in God's sight. I don't know if you knew that, that you're not perfect, but you're not. All right. Only God is perfect. And God does not look on the outward appearance because you might do, you know, outwardly, you might doing lots of really good things. And people might think, well, you're a good person or you do this or you do that. However, God looks on the heart. So not only do our needs, our deeds, what we do, need to be perfectly good and they should be and it's good to do good things for others 
but our thoughts and our motivation, everything needs to be pure, holy and true. Some people do things to be seen to be doing things or some, things, some people do things to get the praise of doing things. But we want to be able to do things because it's love. We're motivated by love. Love's more powerful than anything else. And so our motives have to be pure. And God's word says in 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin. So everything that's dishonest, wicked, wrong, it's called unrighteousness. It's called, it's sin, okay? And sin is what separates us from going to heaven. Therefore, sin must be dealt with. It must be removed from us if we're to have access to God in heaven. And as I said, man's imperfect and man, we cannot do anything to make us good enough or acceptable and worthy enough before God. In our goodness, in our best of days, we cannot, we're still not good enough because God is so much higher. So what did God do? Let's turn to John chapter 3. Verse 16, John 3, 16 and 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. All right. God loves you and he sent his son. Jesus was willing to come and Jesus took the punishment of your sin and my sin when he died on the cross so that we can receive eternal life if we believe. It's the provision's been made, but it's only available for those who believe. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, and we read here verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us with not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's not God's will for you to perish, for your life to be destroyed, for you to miss out on heaven. That is not God's will. But in order for that not to happen is that we need to re repent. So what does it mean to repent? Repent means to have sorrowful regret about the things you've done wrong right you really know lord i've messed up i've messed up i know it i've done things he knows it but you've got to know it for yourself and be willing to confess it to the lord and then continue in and and, and not want to do wrongdoing you know to change your ways and to turn from a life of doing sin doing your own thing and follow god going his ways which his ways lead all the way to heaven. Our way, left to our own devices, leads to hell. And it's a fiery hell and it's for all eternity. And you know, hell was never meant for humanity. It was meant for the devil and his fall and the fallen angels. But because the devil is so deceiving and sin is deceitful, oh, I can do this, no one will know, no one will see, I can get away with this, no one's watching. God sees everything. You cannot hide from God. And do not let the devil have his way and take you to hell when God has paid the price for you to come to heaven. So how can we have our sins forgiven? Let's turn to Matthew 18. And verse 11, it says here, this is what Jesus said, for the son of man, speaking of himself, Jesus, is come to save that which was lost. What are people lost in? Sin. And that's destroying their bodies, their lives and their eternal future. That's what sin does. It's so destructive. And Jesus said, I'll just read John 14, 6. He said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no man comes to the father, but by him, by me, he said. You can't get to God, the Father, through Mary. You can't get to God through the Pope. You can't get through Buddha. You can't get through any other way. Jesus said, he's the way. There is no other way. He is the only mediator between us and God. Is the man Christ Jesus in the middle. And so what did Jesus do? 
Jesus who is God in flesh as your substitute took the punishment of your sins when he shed his pure blood and died on the cross. And at the age of 33 and a half years old, he was spat on, he was beaten, his beard was plucked, a crown of long thorns pierced his head and he was viciously whipped. And the, by the whipping he bore for you, it tore flesh off his back. They said they made furrows down his back. He carried through those furrows, by those stripes, he carried every pain, every sickness, every weakness and every disease, just so you do not have to. And he was then crucified, which means nails were pierced through his hands and his feet, securing to the cross. He then hung on that cross for six horrendous hours. And being crucified is the most cruciating way a person can die. Because when you hang on a cross, your body slumps. So your lungs are slumped. And to get one breath, you have to push up on those nailed feet to get one breath. And to get that one breath, he's rubbing his bare, torn, fleshy back against that timber on the back, on his back. For one breath. Just excruciating pain one breath but he came to fulfill scripture and in the old testament there was a lamb sacrificed in the morning at our 9 a.m or three the third hour they say and it, another lamb sacrificed at the ninth hour or our 3 p.m so from our 9 a.m to 3 p.m is six hours jesus was the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice he came to fulfill all scripture he's the lamb of god that was slain for us He's the Passover lamb and he did it for you and he did it for me and he suffered so much. And Jesus was afflicted and it means he suffered severe distress with bodily and mental suffering, misery and pain. And Jesus did this for you and for me. And all this happened to Jesus until he was almost unrecognizable. God's word says his vision, his, his, what he looked like was so marred more than any single person that's ever been. They could hardly recognize him as a man. He was pulverized, bloodied, torn. It was just awful. And after being crucified, Jesus was then buried for three days and three nights. And then he rose from the dead and was seen by many. And if I turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. And verses 3 and 4, it says here, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And if we turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2, right down the back, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, speaking of Jesus, verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the cross, that's the, on the tree on the cross, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. So there's those stripes that went on his back. And I'll just read it from the Amplified. It says, he personally bore our sins in his own body on the tree as on an altar and offered himself on it that we might die, cease to exist to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. That's past tense. You have been healed. Past tense looking at the finished work of the cross. So Jesus' impact on the world was enormous like no other man. In fact, the current calendar is dated BC, meaning before Christ and AD, and Domini, meaning the year of our Lord. So our calendar to this day was changed because of the life of Jesus Christ. Well, God is calling you, the real you, not the outside of you. Like we do a lot to look after the outside of us. You know, we eat well, we sleep well, we go to the gym or we walk or we, whatever we do to look after the outside. But the real you, because the, the real you 
is eternal. That's inside. Your soul, your spirit is eternal. Your outside is going to eventually die. If you die before Jesus returns, all right, you're, it's going to return to the dust. But the real you is eternal. And so where is the real you going to spend eternity? And you can choose today to spend eternity in heaven rather than in hell. If we turn back to Romans chapter 6. And verse 23, it says here, for the wages, the payment of sin is death, right? It's just what it's God's saying. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is offering you a gift. The choice is yours. God will not put your hand up your back. God is offering that choice. And a humble person will admit to sin and understand they need to confess to God and ask and receive his forgiveness. Will you humble yourself and call out to God? God is offering you a new beginning a, to start afresh. I'll read it. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews 8 verse 12. It says, for I, this is God saying, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. How wonderful is that? Once God forgives your sins, he no longer remembers them or, he, or records them. You'll have nothing against you, right? Because at the moment, if you've got unrepented sin, the list goes on and on and on and on. And if you've never turned to God, imagine how long the list is. But once you turn to God, sincerely, he just erases all of that and you start afresh. And it says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. This salvation that God is offering you, it's a gift and it's free because Jesus paid the price. So God is calling you. And you know, you cannot work for your salvation. You need to believe that Jesus Christ, he paid the price for your salvation. It's a free gift for you to receive. And I'll just read here 1 Peter 1 verse 23. 1 Peter 1 23. And it says here, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. This new beginning is being born again spiritually on the inside. God wants to do something in your heart today on the inside. So you have that experience called born again. And when you're born again, truly things change. It's not having a, about having a mental, oh, I believe in God up here. Oh, I believe there's a God or whatever. When you're born again, things change on the inside. You become a new creation. In fact, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. It's a new creation. All things are passed away and behold, all things become new. When you're born again, truly, you don't want to do the old things. You don't want to do the things that displease God. You want to do the things and walk in God's ways. Amen. And so God's offering you a fresh start, but this time not by yourself and your own strength. This time with God's help, living your life his way, following his ways written down in the Bible and allowing him to be Lord of your life. He doesn't just want to be saviour. He wants to be Lord of your life. Saviour is all right. You receive him as your saviour, but Lord is you serve him. You want to serve him and he wants to be Lord and saviour of your life. And God, he is God and he knows what is best for your life. And, you know, he's never going to abandon you. Once you give your life to him, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you through every situation. Being a Christian is not just a, be, um, a, a wonderful, easy life. The thing is, we live in a natural world, but God will be with us in every situation. And he will always be there to help you. 
And so God desires to blot out all the sins of your past and to give you a future. And his love for you is so great that for exchange for all your sins, transgressions, iniquities, uncleanness and guilt of your current life, he will give you peace in your heart and mind and eternal life. Will you receive God's free gift of salvation? Again, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of God, God's standards. And it's sin which is in our heart and shows itself in what we say, think and do that separates us from God. But I want you to know that God loves you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to take the punishment of your sin. And Jesus, he'd done nothing wrong. He was absolutely innocent. And he took your place and your judgment by dying the most painful of deaths when he died on the cross was buried and then he was raised from the dead three days later. And as I said, he was seen by many. So to receive God's free gift of salvation, you'll need to do four things. Number one, admit you're a sinner. There's sin and that you need a savior. Number two, be willing to turn from your sins and ask God to forgive you. Number three, believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and rose from the grave. And number four, invite Jesus to be your saviour and Lord of your life. The scripture says in Romans 10, 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is waiting for each person to call out to him. And so now's the time. I'm just going to turn back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 21. It says here, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And saved means to be delivered from destruction, from death and the consequences of sin and admission to heaven brought about by Jesus Christ's sacrifice. So what must you do? Acts 3, verse 19. It says, Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And Romans 10, Romans 10, verses 8 to 10, it says, But what says thee, the word is nigh thee, even thy mouth and in thy heart, which is the word we pre by faith which we preach, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart the man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So salvation has to be in your heart and in your mouth, not in your head. You're not a Christian because you think you are. You're a believer because it's in your heart and it's in your mouth. And 1 John 1 verse 9. And we read here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what did it say? If we confess our sins, if we confess to him. All right. Unrighteousness again, wrongdoing, wickedness and dishonest ways. He wants to get that out and cleansed so let's all stand where we are let's all stand so i'm just going to ask you what about you what about you you know right now where do you stand with god is there sin in your life separating you from god who's holy and pure right now if you took your last breath would you go to heaven or to a fiery hell and only by getting your life right with God and continuing to live right with God will you be received by the Lord God into heaven. Or you might know you're not in the place with God as you should be. You used to be full on for, the, for God, but now you're not serving him as you should. You've let other things steal your relationship with God and you want to come back to him right now. 
or you might be unsure if you're saved or not. The devil's always lying to you and telling you that you're not saved. So right now, you too can make sure that you're saved. You know, we serve God because we love him and are thankful for his great sacrifice that he made for us. You know, remember, Jesus stood openly, unashamedly on the cross with his arms outstretched wide just to prove how much he loves you. If you were the only person in the world, Jesus still would have come and died just for you. That's how valuable you are for God. Jesus Christ actually died for you. So today is the day of salvation. And that means now. And so to receive God's free gift of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and to make a fresh start today by surrendering your life to him, then just say the following prayer aloud after me. And as you believe, believe in your heart and say this prayer sincerely from your heart and say it out of your mouth, right? God will hear you. He will forgive you and he'll cleanse away all your sins. All right, so let's all bow our heads and close our eyes and pray after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I confess that I have sinned against you and others. I am sorry for everything I have done wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ took all my sins and sicknesses upon himself when he died on the cross for me and rose again on the third day. Lord, you said in your word that if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. So, Father, right now, I give you my life and I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Saviour and my Healer who died for me and then rose from the dead. Lord, just as you have forgiven me, I choose to forgive every person who has ever harmed or wronged me. Thank you, Lord, for your love, forgiveness, mercy, and giving me eternal life. Amen. Amen. You open your eyes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you've prayed that sincerely from your heart as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, I announce that your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. 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 The, the, the hearts are clean. The slate is clean. And how good is that? Everything's clean on the inside. All right. All up to date. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Praise God. So welcome to the family of God. Um, please be seated. God loves you and so do we. And if you said this prayer, we'd like you to let us know. You can send us an email to info at rfdu.com. That's rfdu, revival from down under, rfdu.com. And God's word says in Ephesians 1 verse 6, to the praise and the glory of his grace, favor and mercy, where he's made us accepted in the beloved. You are now part of God's family. God accepts you because you've got your heart right with him, believed in your heart, confessed with your mouth, you are part of God's family, all right? You're, ex you're accepted and you belong to God's family. And you have a heavenly father who loves you. You have a brother, Jesus Christ, who has already proved his love for you. And you are also part of God's worldwide family of believers. He has believers in every nation. It's a big family, hallelujah. And salvation is just the beginning of your walk with God. So this is just the beginning. But God wants you to grow in his ways. And so we would encourage you to do the following. So number one, we would always say, uh, talk to the Lord every day. 
even during the day, any time during the day, all day. Just talk to the Lord. You talk to him like you talk to your best friend because he wants to be and he is actually your very, very best friend because he's with you all the time. And you can tell him everything because he wants to help you. And, and, and having a, being in God is about having a relationship with him. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. It's a loving relationship. Number two, read your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, get with somebody who does. And, and um, if not, we've got it on, the, on our website, rfdu.com. There's a King James with a parallel amplified Bible. And you know, when you read the Bible, it helps you understand God's plan and his love for you. All right. And God's word feeds your spiritual man. You know, I said like you've got a natural man, you feed your body, you have meals every day. Well, it's only the word of God that feeds your spiritual man. He's hungry because you've just given him, you've just, you've just brought him alive. So he's hungry. So he's going to want feeding every day. Feed him with the word of God so he becomes strong. Number three, attend church. Right? We go to church because we learn, help us grow in the ways of God. It's good company to be in. Be with believers. It's very good company. And we receive communion and you give your tithes and offerings. And that way, God's blessings will chase you down. It's God's way. God is teaching us to be givers like him and money. So, so many people have a problem with money. But here's God trying to train us to be thinking of others. And so we give offerings and we acknowledge God in our tithes, which is 10% of all increase. We acknowledge that all increase comes from him because God owns everything. He just gives it into our hands to see what we're going to do with it. Can he trust you with what he's given you? Because if he can, he'll be able to trust you with more. But if he can't trust you with a little, well, then why would he want to let all these other things happen for you? All right, so, you know, God wants the best for your life. Number four, get water baptized. Jesus was water baptized. He said, follow me. He was fully immersed, right? It's not a sprinkling of water. You are, it's a burial of your old life. And you come up out of that water to walk in a new life. It's no longer your own life. You walk into life to serve him. All right. And once you get baptized or even vice versa, you, God wants to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's a gift. God gives you the Holy Spirit. And you, Jesus said, I'm going back to heaven, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with you and he's going to be in you. And you know you've got him in you because you'll be able to speak in a heavenly language. Just like we speak English here. The Holy Spirit has a language of his own and it's him speaking to God, making intercession. And you need the Holy Spirit. It builds your faith up. It makes intercession for others and he helps you understand the book. God, Jesus never meant you to walk this Christian walk without the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. And number five, be around strong Christians who will encourage you with your walk in the Lord. Hallelujah. And so may the Lord who loves you very much bless you, protect you and walk with you every day. And everyone said, Amen.